Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mia Johnson. Uh, I use she, they pronouns. I'm the Dorchester uh, Food Co-op Community Organizer. And I'm gonna do a lead with a grounding um, before we begin. And then um, Robin and Liz, who are part of the co-op board are gonna introduce themselves and we'll kind of, we'll begin to proceed from there. Um, so I wanna ground us in um, understanding that we're on Pumpkin Puck, uh, Massachusetts land. Um, and we're also on the land of, the, of those who were enslaved, who um, came through the ports and, and um, are here as a result of um, being part of a part of colonization and systemic white supremacy and, and bringing people to this land. Um, and as a result have um, continued to be resilient and um, both in, in both qualities have been people who have been um, fighting back against uh, genocide and um, continued uh, impacts of uh, being uh, landless people. Um, on a land that they have um, adapted to. Um, and in that, we want to um, welcome um, ourselves here and welcome each of you who have come here also um, to support and steward this land with us together. Um, and Robin, and, and so I'm gonna ask that as you are here, um, if you can drop your name, your pronoun and um, your neighborhood or if you're a co-op member of a co-op into the chat um, to introduce your by way of introduction and Robin and Liz will introduce themselves um, as well. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Robin Saunders, member of Dorchester Food Co-op, also a community gardener uh, with the trustees on the trustees community gardens as well as a gardener in Dorchester food um, in the Dorchester greenhouse <laughs> or the Dudley greenhouse, all the same neighborhoods, right? <laughs> and I also live in Dorchester. Liz? Hi everyone, my name is Liz Wang. Um, I live in the Fields Corner neighborhood of Dorchester. I am a member of the Dorchester Food Co-op and my preferred pronouns are she, her. Um, and I also am new to gardening and farming, but I am working at the food project uh, as a seasonal grower's assistant. Thank you. And we're going to go to um, our presentation now. Um, I'm going to share my screen, which I'm struggling to see. Give me one second. Um, and we're gonna, I'm, so I'm also, I just wanted to highlight this as we share this, I'm going to be reading um, from this book, um, which will be dropped in the chat. So you can, so if you can't see all of it, you'll, you'll see the, the book and the reference. I'm gonna be reading from this book um, as we, as you take a, a minute to eat, to look at um, what our uh, partners, our sister organization, the sister co-op in Oakland um, called the uh, deep, uh, deep East Oakland empowering the people or deep. So sorry, I think I accidentally muted you for a second. Um, that's okay. Um, and, um, and so I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share each of these slides. And as I share them, I'm going to read some of the findings, um, from the co-op and collective economy movement um, from the eyes of uh, black folks um, in the US context. Um, so just, and I also wanted to share with you um, our mission statement at the Dorchester Food Co-op. Um, so just sharing that and letting you get a chance to read that. Also, if you don't know this, you can move, if you see all the people on your uh, right-hand side, if you click at the top, in the black space, you can move your you can move folks down so you can read things or move them around if you want to have access to more of the screen. If you don't already know that, 
And with that, I'm going to begin. So this is just going to be a few a few slides of, and I'd like to start uh, the reading. In every period of American history, African Americans pooled resources to solve personal, family, social, political, and economic challenges. They often address freedom, health, child, child development, education, burial, employment, and investment in cooperative ventures in ways that leverage the max and maximize the returns and reduced risk. African-Americans formed distinct, purposeful, and formal as well as informal organizations th through which to coordinate and channel collective action and joint ownership. Many of these were stable collective organizations that lasted for decades. What I'm reading is not the same as what you're seeing, so I'm just giving you more information as you look at the dates and times. African Americans used existing connections and affiliations, religious, fraternal, geographic, and political to develop new organizations or, pro or promote new missions. These existing networks provided the sense of trust and solidarity that often helped solidify the new effort. Racial solidarity, for example, became a major resource for these and future black organizations and businesses. African-American women played significant roles, held leadership positions, and often formed their own organizations throughout these periods and across every kind of organization. As founders and main participants in many mutual aid societies, women were instrumental in organizational development, fundraising, day-to-day -day coordination, and networking for cooperatives as well as other organizations. Many, if not all these efforts were targeted for destruction by white supremacists, unsympathetic, often fearful whites and or white economic competitors, the plantation block and or corporatists. White competitors use slander, violence, murder, physical destruction and economic sabotage. They burn down the offices, farms, houses owned by these organiza organizations or their members. They shot and lynched leaders, members, and their families. They accused black leaders of mail fraud and treason, jailed them and initiated federal indictments. They denied loans to fledgling businesses. They established their own businesses to undercut and outcompete the black products and services. They even passed laws to outlaw the activities in which black organizations and collectives were engaged. African-Americans involved in collective economic activities often found that they also needed to engage in political activities to enact public policies or counteract white blocks of, and racially discriminatory legislation. In addition, African Americans often found it necessary to engage in collective economic practices in order to achieve or maintain the independence they needed to assert themselves politically. Lessons learned from the African American owned businesses that were formal cooperative ventures included the need for education and training of members, leaders and managers, stable and adequate capitalization and clientele the building of trust and solidarity among members and support from the community. And finally, I wanted to, to pause and share one group that folks may have already heard of. Um, 
And just to give a moment to have everyone have a chance to read this, um, we're also gonna drop it in the chat as an opportunity to reflect um, what we've learned and what we're learning about the history of cooperatives and maybe why some of that history has gone unseen or misunderstood as to where it is today and why it is that so many cooperatives right now are being developed by um, BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, and currently why part of the reason that we are developing the Dorchester Food Co-op. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and come back to everybody. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna break out into um, two groups. Well, we'd love to have, um, welcome back. I'm glad everyone got to have a, a deep discussion. I'm, I wanna apologize. I thought we, it was 3.20. I thought somehow we ran through all the time and I was like, oh my God. So I hope that we're just gonna take some more time um, to, to discuss and share back. So um, we're gonna open this up for uh, just some reflections and like, what did, what did we notice and learn in, in our discussions, what came up? Um, so just opening the floor. And I, and I do wanna add, you know, since Liz and Robin were in the groups if they wanna pull up anything too. Um, I we had, a, we had a note taker in our group, so I don't mind handing the mic over to our note taker, and she was gonna share a couple of takeouts. Sure, um, that's me, uh, Laura. Um, we talked about uh, people, people were interested to hear about the history of co-ops and uh, hadn't thought m much about the sort of long, long view of those. and. There was some interest in the local history of um, from of Massachusetts cooperatives um, that mm -hmm. somebody who recently moved here um, was curious about and thought she might learn more about. Um, one of our group members grew up in Boston in the 70s and remembers uh, the Black Panthers the Black Panther Party organizing in Jamaica Plain and providing food uh, for local kids, I think, was it um, at schools, at her school. Uh, there was discussion about the Kambahi um, River Collective and how that was uh, connected to the Kambahi uh, Feminist Collective from the 70s, 80s and interested to make the connection to that place and um, that history. And there was a question about, I, I think this was um, sort of where did the ideas for cooperatives come from? Were they, did they start in, in churches or labor unions? Sort of where was the growth coming from about those? And uh, there was some discussion about um, alternative economic models, the New Economy Coalition, um, Center for Economic Democracy were a couple organizations that were discussed and brought up. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any other topics that I missed, chime in. Yeah, so let's, um, what I'd like to do is just pause and open the floor up and then have the other group share back and if something that there's some kind of things that bubble up from both. And thanks to Laura for taking notes and anybody who's taking notes and sharing, um, or if there are things you wanna add into the chat. Um, I would also wanna mention uh, Ujima Project, which is part of the Democracy Center, which has really been an important institution, particularly lifting up working class black folks um, in the Roxbury, Dorchester, and Mattapan community, as well as like doing the, the, com the comprehensive work of, of interracial um, organizing together. Um, and economic stability. Does anybody else want to share from um, the group with Robin and Laura? Or have questions? <laughs> they you were can not. Raise your hand, and Annabelle will help to unmute you. 
so much to absorb and to learn. Much. They would, they, our group was very um, talkative while we were in the group. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did notice, um, I did take a quick note that Elise had mentioned about the, um, the quilt makers in Guise Bend and how mm -hmm. very similar to um, just history, um, tying history um, back to the collective and to the community. Brucey had mm -hmm. mentioned how when, and Brucey, you're welcome to speak for yourself. I don't wanna speak for you if you'd like to unmute yourself, but um, if I don't hear. So what I, what I had said was that right. early during the COVID um, period that we're still in, I first heard about mutual aid groups and I thought, oh, that's a new thing. And then one day I got curious and I looked it up online and I went, oh, that's not new. That's been around a while and it was an African-American creation and it, and now I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much. And, and there was a question in the chat about, um, you know, where where co-ops came from. And they really came out of uh, many different places, like they evolved into and developed, but a lot of it came out of just um, one communities, um, you know, the black community was had to rely on it, itself and each other. Um, and were forced because of segregation, because of Jim Crow, um, because of enslavement and, and finding their own way forward. Um, began between mutual aid societies, uh, through churches, through um, living in, in, in proximity to each other, um, through fraternities. Um, so it, it goes into much much more depth in the book, The Collective Courage that I was had shared earlier. It's a great resource um, in how over, over these kind of things over, over time stack together um, through some unions, but um, black folks weren't exactly allowed to be part of unions initially, right? So they had to create their own economy, which is in their own way of moving forward and moving their community forward in land ownership, business ownership, um, and the resilience that it took to maintain those even as they were being taken down. So as they were building one idea, it would be taken down. So um, cooperative banking really comes out of the black struggle of, and we, have, we owe a lot of debt to um, the black community for bringing in um, the union bank banking, right? Because that's really where that got started and the type of insurance that was developed from community collective um, accountability. So just wanting to hold that, that, that this is how we, we some of these things that we um, credit unions, how these things were formed, really were informed because of a collective struggle of black uh, people, um, uh, you know, both uh, uh, getting free and, and freeing themselves through um, from um, this economic strife that it continues to be something that we struggle in um, today. I was sharing in the group my um, per perspective on on that um, a little, and I got I got the chance to do some thinking about this about ten years ago when I was um, hosting a, a, a workshop on radical uh for the what was it called the radical organizing uh conference that they yeah, did that was a good one <laughs> back in the day right yeah. and so they um uh, so that's when i got introduced to you know dr gordon emhard not that i've met read a ton of her stuff but um and and started learning about that and um that piece of the history and and i kind of came out of that experience with this perspective that you know the legal form of cooperatives in terms of like worker co-ops and um you know consumer co-ops or or producer co-ops that that we have here um oh, oh partly you know partly they're 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 based in um yeah they're based in this this history of um african-american self-determination in the u.s um i think also maybe partly there's a strand that goes back to um how people um were kind of fighting back against industrialization mm -hmm. in in europe um, and then also, um, to me, it was important to look at, you know, in, in Latin America, um, you know, traditions that, that people had before colonization um, that, that maybe still, you know, carried in, on in practice today, um, you know, in South America, in uh, Central America, um, in, you know, Brazil with the um, landless 
um, people's movement, you know, now in terms of reclaiming land and the Zapatistas in terms of reclaiming land collectively, um, the, the, these things are all connected. And so probably no matter what culture or background you come from, you know, there's, there, this is an important part of your history too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Maria Cristina. Yeah. So I'm going to pass it to the next group um, and share some notes and also just like, again, brain, like share what you, what you were sharing. Liz, do you want to? Yeah, uh, we didn't have an official note taker, but I think I'll, you know, spot out some things that were mentioned and then pass it off to whoever wants to speak more on it. Um, you know, we had some questions just about the general Dorchester food co -op, so we kind of talked about synopsis of that and the importance of of the work and for economic empowerment and also like food sovereignty. Um, and then someone had mentioned about a book they were reading and the, the presence and the contributions of BIPOC women. Um, we talked about some cases, Palma had posted some like kind of some historical cases in the chat. And we talked a bit about like the Massachusetts Historical Society and what they've been doing. Um, yeah, and uh, thinking about um, someone else who's involved in a co-op was sharing about um, how to bring more of this learning in to the rest of the folks and how, you know, this history can inform how we move in a co-op. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that, yeah. Um, and I, I think just like my personal reflection just really um, inspired to see folks, you know, looking to learn more. We're all kind of in different stages, feeling very uh, maybe uneasy because it's like we don't know a lot and we're, you know, we want to know more about how do we learn more and um, it's a lot of information, but, you know, I think it's very rewarding to be able to learn and grow with others. Um, and just be humbled and be accountable that, you know, we should be learning more and we will never know enough, but we don't stop, right? So, and with that, yeah, I'll pass it off to anyone else who wants to share more about what y'all shared, because y'all shared a lot, for sure. Come on, guys, give us some more information here. We're gonna share a little bit more after this about our co-op and what we were doing, but we wanted to give time to really honor you know, the, you know, the hundreds of years that have been spent to develop co-ops and to really hold that place. It's so important um, to remember our, our shared history, but also this earned history that's a gift to us. You know, um, I didn't share this earlier, I'm Mescalero Apache. Um, from the Southwest, and we in our culture we have a culture of gifting. Um, so to me, this is a gift that uh, has been handed over, and that I get to also share and offer. Um, so to, it's very important that we honor that time and the effort that um, all the many hands and lives it took to bring this forward, particularly um, against the many obstacles, but also the the joy that we're that we are being able to re receive and and also hope to, to, you know, build and continue to build um, with our community here. So does anybody from Liz's group or any of the other groups wanna share? I um, just wanna make sure that there are space for that and, or questions, you know, I think there's been some really great um, observations in the chat as well. I wanted to say, um, uh, I, the food co-op, I have been so excited about it um, coming to fruition. Um, I grew up in a really small town in Greenwood, Mississippi. And um, as far as food um, uh, security, uh, we took care of our own. Everybody had a garden. Everybody had, you know, some type of, my grandfather owned a farm. He grew all of our meat products. My mom grew all of the vegetables and everything. And my grandfather also grew vegetables, but we took care of each other. There was some older people that couldn't garden or do whatever. So everybody just shared, everybody in the whole town just shared with each other. And, you know, and I was thinking about um, how we took care of each other. Um, it was a culture I grew up with, you know, 
taking care of each other, you know? And it was a real big shock to me to move to the city and, um, you know, there's no land and there's no place to grow anything, you know? But I'm really excited about this co-op because I think it would be uh, absolutely great for the black community to be able to, um, I thought about people who are getting SNAP and things like that, they, their money would go so much further if they was able to buy a 50 pound bag of rice and it lasted three months instead of uh, getting a small bag from the store and it lasted in one month, you know? So yeah. I, I think things like that would, it's, it's gonna be um, a great impact on black community. Thank you, Elnora. And it is, it is how do we build together, right? What are we building? And what is our role like as we move this forward? One thing I really enjoy about the collective is that the collective, um, and it, you know, it's a it, the collective was the colony was a many many different groups of of uh, black women that like built around different things, but also reclamation of land, and some of it was craft, and some of it was farming, and um, so there's a lot of there's a there are many different groups, and we know the a lot of people have heard of the Geese Bend because of their quills. Um, but there were other groups of, of uh, Black women that, that really restored land and really kind of just created their own societies um, and persisted, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that's really beautiful about that is like the persistence of the persistent spirit, right? Of finding a way forward. And I think about like in Dorchester, you know, we have, our community is, is super diverse right now. We have so many different inputs and yet how do we hold the persistence of the black community and the persistence of the immigrant black community and the persistence of the Vietnamese community and the persistence of the white working classes continue to maintain being able to hold on to living in, in Boston, which is no small feat. Um, Boston has continued to scale up in gentrification, continue to scale up in cost and, and being able to just survive being here um, is, is not, no small feat. So just wanting to acknowledge just like how beautiful it is that we have so many cultures in one place and so many people coming from different places and persisting to live here and wanting to build a store that is um, coming out of such rich roots. So really just really happy to do that. Um, so I'm just gonna pause for one last, any opportunity for anybody wanna share any last thing that they were excited about. Um, and then we're gonna go to Robin and we're gonna share, we're gonna, I know folks wanna talk about the Dorchester Food Co-op, we, we planned on having time to do that. So we're gonna share our video um, and uh, that we, we were able to create at the end of last summer. Um, but before we do that, does anybody have any last comments or things that they're just wanting to, to share and enlighten us with? Okay, Robin, you want to line us up? So Annabelle, we're going to give it, can we co-host with Robin and um, Robin's going to share a screen? You should be able to. Yep. I am ready. Do you see it before I press play? Yeah, great. We do. Do you want to make it um, ex expand the screen? Yep. Mm. Okay. And is everybody else muted? Please, everybody else mute your mic. Yeah, muting my Except for Mia. Mia, you can stay on. I think that stuff comes from Elnora's garden, though. Yes, yeah, true. Oh, mute. Um, but everybody else, please mute before I press, press play. All right. Uh, on three. I think Elnora, your mic, or maybe not. Okay, one, two, three. The Dorchester Food Co-op is a grocery store that is owned by the community and the workers. We will lift up neighborhood voices to create a co-op that truly celebrates our diverse and vibrant communities.
Let's build an innovative public space committed to racial, economic, and worker justice. That will enhance the health and well-being of our community. Cooperation is our approach and justice is our goal. Cooperación es nuestro enfoque y la justicia es nuestra meta. Cooperación es nuestra presentación. Justice is our objective. Cooperation is our approach. Justice is our goal. I want to help you and help you and help you with your goal. Cooperation is our approach. Justice is our goal. We have an opportunity to really uh, more profoundly embrace and engage the community in something that matters. And food matters. With 20 plus local farms and food entrepreneurs, over 30 regional partners, more than 900 member owners and counting, the Dorchester Food Co-op is coming to 195 Bowdoin Street. Our full service grocery store will offer locally and sustainably sourced affordable food from fresh produce to bulk goods and beyond. It's a place to shop, learn and connect with your neighbors. If you become a member of the Dorchester Food Co-op, you're going to become an owner of a grocery store. The Dorchester Food Co-op's mission involves giving power back to the people. The community owns it, literally. The folks that work there are owners, and folks that shop there can be owners. Everything that the co-op does is determined by the community and all of the surplus value that the store creates goes back to the community. The community got together and did this. So people in the neighborhood can build something that they own. To have something that is for us, where we can have access to healthy food, and that it's being grown by the people who live in the community is to me what justice is all about. So it's all connected, economic justice, racial justice, um, and doing it in a community that often feels left behind. Something that our community deserves, and it's something that uh, clearly the community is working to make it happen. Become a member, become an owner. Invest, donate, join at dorchesterfoodcoop.com. Uh, thanks, Liz, for for sharing the sites. Uh, we, yeah, we we just are so excited. I'm so excited to be a part of this project. Um, the community organizer for the Dorchester Food Co-op, and um, I, you know, I cannot express how happy I am that we've had um, three rounds of uh, design input with community members, both um, in in the neighborhood and on Zoom. And we've broken ground in, in January and the building is coming up and we're hoping to hire a general manager soon. And we're hoping to launch our capital campaign soon. Um, and we're over 945 members. And we are, our goal is to get to 1200 members by you know, the end of December, um, because that will help us be able to reach our uh, financial goals. So we can really do all the things we wanna be able to do when we open the store. Um, and so we are pitching and hoping that you, if you're not a member already, that you will join us um, in our uh, fight and struggle to bring good quality, culturally sensitive food to our neighborhood. Um, and that it can make sure that we have people um, in the neighborhood working as worker owners in the store and helping to make decisions to keep the store alive and vibrant um, for years to come. So. Um, opening the floor to questions. I know that Liz said that you all had some questions when you were talking with Liz and we wanna make sure we give some space. We also dropped the, in the chat um, uh, how, to, how to become a member and where to sign up as well. Uh, thanks, Laura. Thank you so much. Um, so we just wanted to open the floor up for any questions while we have so, a moment. Um, just a little bit more about the project that we're working on and yeah. Just a basic question. What's, it might not be easy to answer. What's the expected opening date for the co-op? Because we and my family are really excited, so. Yeah, yeah. So we, like I said, we broke ground in January. 
um, in the in the freezing tundra of the ground <laughs> in Bowdoin and Toplift. And um, it's we're hoping to open in 2020, uh, 2022, sorry. Um, but it, it will depend on, we're hoping to get in, it, it'll take about uh, 10 months for us to do the build out if everything goes out, goes smoothly once the frame of the building is up. So that's my best answer. I also know Jenny is here, who's knows and Liz and Robin may have a more specifics, but that's what I've got for you. Anybody else want to? add in on that yeah thanks Mia um, my name is Jenny and I've been involved in the project for a long time so Mia's totally right about the timeline um, and you know everything is a little bit because I was over at the site today and uh, it's really exciting if you go over there um, we've been working on this also I wanted to say to Mita you've been working your co-op was worked on for 10 years so we are just entering our 10th year. So it's good to hear that it just takes a long time to organize the co-op. Um, but this, in the site, you'll see there's a lot of the foundation that's been poured, um, but it's a very big building. And the other thing I wanna say is that we're very, um, we feel very privileged to be part of an affordable housing project. So this building is gonna have 41 units of affordable housing, which is so needed in our community as well. So being co-located there is, is great. And that's what partly why it's going to take a long time. It's a big, it's a big building to build before we get in to build our space. And we're the only commercial unit in the building. And we'll also have um, access to the, we'll have the, we'll be uh, facilitating the parking spaces. So there'll, have, there'll be 25 above ground parking spaces for the co-op itself. Um, and then there's parking for the residents under a uh, below ground. Um, so uh, we wanted to really make sure that folks who are going to access the store by car have the ability to and or Uber pickups or other kinds of service pickups. And there's also a bus stop that's right on the street um, in front of the store. So there's multiple access points. It'll be bike racks. Yep. It, there's definitely going to be biking, <laughs> biking and skateboarding. It already happens in the neighborhood. That's already a thing. <laughs> yeah. It's also close to, you know, lots of other kinds of stores and restaurants and other kinds of mm -hmm. things that, you know, people can combine their, their trips um, mm -hmm. as well as being right across the street from the family mm -hmm. nurturing project, which for people who don't know is a wonderful group that, um, Oh, you went muted. You went muted. Joanne, you went family, muted. The Family Nurturing Center. Thanks, thanks, Mia. Um, the Family Nurturing Center, which helps um, uh, people have, you know, healthy families and welcomes new babies with gifts and things like that. So um, that's a nice, a nice pairing. Yeah. There's some questions in the chat. Um, uh, Talia was asking about um, how the well um, the video talked about ownership and if you could explain a little bit more about what being what being a co-owner means. Yeah, Robin, I see you bang, shaking your head. Do you want to take this one or yeah? Okay, I'm gonna pass it to Robin. Robin's like, yes, I'm on it. No, um, I, yes. I wasn't saying yes. Definitely. I wanted it. And I also want to say I'm also a member, a uh, member owner, right? So I think all of us uh, who are here are, are, are representing the co-op right now are all members. So. And there are a number of um, member owners in with this group of 19 that we are here. And what that basically means is. Um, we have, a, there's a membership owner fee of $100 for Dorchester Food Co-op. Um, and once you pay either all in full as a full, full payment or an, as an installment, you become a member. You're an owner of the Dorchester Food Co-op. Um, that gives you rights to vote. As an owner, you have voting rights. So you get to vote in who the board members are as well as run for a board uh, position. Um, and then you have um, input and a say into all the major decisions of the co-op. Um, so when we say member owners, we mean you really are a member owner. And to, to like equate that with other businesses, um, credit unions are all co-ops, cooperatives. So if you, are, if you have an account with a credit union, you're an owner actually of the credit union. 
Um, REI is a business that is a co-op. So um, anybody can shop at REI, but you, anybody also can become a member. You pay a one-time member and then you get dividends at the end of the year based on the amount of money that you spent with them. Um, and that's basically the same for all food co-ops. Your, um, what you get back, your, your, um, your, what is it? Your payment or whatever, it depends on how much you put into the co-op. Um, and the health of the co-op. And that we, yes, your initial membership fee is part of the equity um, and the initial funding of the co-op. So the more members that we get as the founding member owners is the strength as we go out to get funding for the initial building. And if the co-op's doing well and you move away, you can get your hundred dollars back, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. not like a one-time fee. Um, to me, you know, part of what being an owner means, I mean, there's the, the sort of, you know, the, the legal stuff like Robin's talking about, but there's also, you know, a kind of a pride thing that, you know, when Harvest Co-op in Cambridge was there and I live in Dorchester, so I used to travel a long way and, you know, to, to go there because it was so worth it. But it's just a kind of a psychological thing about like, this is my store. And when like, if, you know, if I was sort of shopping and some other customer would say to me, oh, you know, is there, you know, you know, is, is, is there peanut butter or something? I'd say, yes, we have peanut butter over there. Mm -hmm. Or I would, if I would ask a staff person, I wouldn't say, do you carry, you know, apples? You know, I would say, do we have apples? Cause it's like, Ooh, it's my store. Yay. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a feeling of the money I'm spending on food isn't going like to pay some shareholder that owns stock in Stop and Shop or whatever, it's coming back to our food co-op. And, and so there's and a lot of like feeling stuff as well as the practical stuff that has to do with being a member owner. So that's my, that's my rant for today. <laughs> I love it, thank you. It is also a closed loop. So the, the money that you spend in the neighborhood stays in the neighborhood. And we mean that too, because our food chain and we're gonna be doing uh, the Green Future Fest in April. So you can come and learn about how our food chain is going to work. If you're interested, just plugging it in there. Just plugging it in there. Look at our link tree. We'll be up there. Um, but it'll, you know, we're going to be our, our local farms, like literally our urban farms in the city um, that were featured. Um, one of them was featured in the, in the video will be part of our supply chain. So when we talk about keeping the money local and keeping the money really in the neighborhood and really fueling um, our BIPOC community, that's really what we're doing. It's not just, it's not a figurative or an imaginative. We have those relationships already and are growing them more and more to be as close to, as, as we can to closing the loop and keeping it regional. There's also a question, you don't have to live just in Dorchester to be a member. You can live anywhere. You can live in Spain and be a member. It may not be as beneficial to you, but we'll, we, you know, you can, you know, we're not, no, anyone can be a member everyone is invited um, and you know you can become a member at any time and once you become a member you're you're a member you know there's not a, a, a you know a takeaway or cancel um, membership it looked before like Brucey had a question is that right did I miss it I was trying to follow so there's a question. Um, yeah. Do you know if this is the first food co-op to be included in affordable housing and how, and then the follow-up is how hard was it to get the, the co-op included in that project? The, I'm going to do a quick history because we have only have a couple minutes and then I know Jenny may have more information or, or, or Liz or Robin, they've been working on this longer. You want to go Robin? Robin's going, Robin's going. Okay. Go. I, we, we did mention it. I think I don't know where. Oh, I think in our newsletter that we had members share out. But if anybody that's interested in becoming a member between now and Monday before the workshop is over, so you know you can ponder it for three days now or even beyond if you like. But the promo is if you join the first 15 people that join in the next three days, gets a wonderful what we call our building our in chocolates because our co-op is under construction. So we have construction chocolates. So that's, <laughs> that's the promo if you'd like to become a member, but that isn't the only perk to membership. This is not the only perk to membership. 
but it's an important <laughs> perk and the chocolates are good. Let me just tell you. But to go back to the quick question, thanks Robin for remembering our promo, we forgot. Um, <laughs> um, to really quickly, oh, Jenny, do you wanna just take it? You got one minute to give the answer or sure. less. Can, can we stay on those of us who might have further questions? So, you know, we and maybe... definitely extend a little bit over. Okay. That that's, works for you. All right. That's great. So, yeah, that would be I'm going to put Annabelle. some like some surveys in the chat right now. Peruse at your own leisure. They're also in the program. So, in a nutshell, um, we are really happy to be pairing with a nonprofit developer rather than a commercial developer. And Viet Aid is the developer of this um, house, of this building, and they've been very supportive of the co-op. Um, and you asked about other co-ops. I know that Brattleboro Food Co-op has mm -hmm. um, housing above it, and the new co-op, which is called Urban Greens in Providence, Rhode Island. Also, um, it's they have multiple buildings in this little complex, and, and it is affordable housing um, with them. Um, with all with one developer as well. And I'm just, I don't know about the rest of the country, but um, you know, I think that um, given that I feel like we're mission aligned with um, Viet Aid, and I, I, I would be very terrified of being with a, a commercial developer right now who really only had making money as their goal. So, Penny, I didn't catch the You said you were working with a nonprofit developer? Yes, Viet Aid is the name. Via Aid, which is, um, and they have done a lot of housing around and commercial development around the Fields Corner area. They come out of the Vietnamese community, but they're not exclusively building for the Vietnamese community. They're a community development corporation and their particular niche and community that they are working in or catchment is in Fields Corner. Mm -hmm. And the name of that community development corporation is Viet Aid. Um, but there are many community development corporations across the state. Um, so you can look up MACDC if you're wanting to know more about community development corporations themselves, but they're often are good partners. Um, and as Jenny shared, Brattleboro has partnered with, uh, you know, housing and uh, housing uh, above. And then in, yeah, thank you. And then in um, Providence, they've also, are part of a, a complex mm -hmm. uh, where there are multiple stakeholders. Um, Heather who, just put um, Viet AIDS um, website, web address in the, in the chat. Thanks, Heather. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did we have rice? Oh, <laughs> that's great. It's time to eat. Um, are, there any other, are there any other questions? And thank you for sharing, Heather, in the chat. And the answer to that was yes, rice in a 50 pound bag. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys I so agree. much. And um, lots of bulk foods. That's the, the one of the biggest things that I'm looking forward to because that's something I miss terribly. Me um, too. From, from the the food co-op in Cambridge. I miss um, my blue, blue corn cornmeal, quite frankly. This was so, so great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, and thanks for all the work that you're, you're doing to bring this beautiful place to reality. And um, yeah, if you haven't become a member yet, definitely consider signing up, especially with this great chocolate truck situation. I don't know why you wouldn't sign up. It's such They're a great so good. deal. Um, and um, yeah, look forward to hearing more soon and we'll definitely be blasting on our social media and all that. Um, so um, thank you all. Um, I sent some survey links in the, in the chat. Um, this is um, it for today, but we do have two more days full of amazing workshops. So um, if you, I will resend the link to the program, just um, keep this around. Um, you can send it to other people at this point if they're struggling to um, get in. Um, but um, that program has a schedule with all the links for the next two days of programming. And if you've registered, if you missed something that you really wanted to see, um, you will have access to all of the recordings of all the workshops. And um, I know that um, there are some supplemental materials um, that are in the resources folder for this particular workshop, including some articles and um, there was something else. I'm, I'm 
blank. We have a right. fact sheet. So if you want right. to know like, some of the questions you're asking, we, we broke it down. Amazing. Um, well, thanks again, everyone. Hope you can enjoy some sun now. Thanks for um, taking some time indoors to learn about food cooperatives. Thank you all. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Annabelle, Thank for you. helping to host us.